Hi, my name is Dr. Mark Fulcher. I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician from the FIFA Medical Centre of Excellence in Auckland, New Zealand. In this session, I'd like to talk to you about anterior cruciate ligament injuries in football. While anterior cruciate ligament injuries represent less than 1% of all injuries sustained during football, they're widely publicised because they result in a long absence from sport. The incidence in women's football is about three times that uh, seen in men's football. And in other sports, it's been reported to be as high as a 9 to 1 ratio. The primary function of the ACL is to prevent anterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur, but together with the PCL, it resists and limits hyperextension, hyperflexion, and internal rotation of the tibia. Because of its role in limiting rotation, uh, that's why athletes don't tolerate an ACL deficient knee very well. The ligament is intraarticular and as a result does not heal. High level pivoting athletes therefore typically require a reconstruction of the ligament to be able to return to football predictably. While we're talking here about ACL injuries, it's important to remember that in many cases other structures within the knee are also injured. It's an isolated injury in only about 30% of patients, 50% have an associated meniscal tear, and a number of patients will also have a combined injury involving other ligaments or the articular cartilage injury within the knee. The clinical history provides key information which you can use to make the diagnosis of an ACL injury, and in reality it's probably the single most important part of your assessment. It's important to realise that the majority of ACL tears are non-contact injuries, with about 70% being as a result of a pivoting injury, with only 30% being due to direct trauma. Many patients will describe a song, strong sense of instability or of something going out of place, and will often talk about dislocating their knee or use their hands to, to illustrate what they felt happened in their knee. 50% of them will describe a popping or snapping sensation, which can be something that they hear as well. And about 70% will have a rapid onset of swelling, which implies a hemarthrosis within the knee. The main thing which can present in this way that isn't an ACL tear is a patellar instability episode, and it's important to keep that in, in the back of your mind. Hopefully by the time you finish taking your history, you'll have a clear impression about what the injury is likely to be. With regard to clinical examination, patients will typically have difficulty weight-bearing, they'll usually have an enlarged effusion, and they may also have joint line tenderness. The tenderness is often due to the hemarthrosis itself, but can also be due to an associated meniscal tear or because of the characteristic impaction injury they get. There are several clinical tests though which are useful to assess the integrity of the ACL. Lockman's test is the most single reliable test with a reported sensitivity of 85% and specificity of 95%. But if you combine that test with an AP draw and a pivot shift test, you can increase the sensitivity and specificity even further. And so those three tests are the best individual tests for assessing the integrity of the cruciate ligament, the anterior cruciate ligament. Patients who you believe may have injured their ACL require further investigation. And I think that plain films or x-rays are the most useful initial investigation. Firstly, they can demonstrate other pathology which can present in a similar manner, like fractures. But secondly, there can be some important clues to the diagnosis on plain film. On an AP view, you can see an avulsion fracture from the lateral tibia, known as a Sagon fracture, which is highly suggestive of an injury to the ACL. You can also assess for skeletal maturity in adolescent athletes, and that has a bearing on how the patients go on to be managed. On a lateral view, you can see potentially an avulsion from the tibial spine, which uh, is more common in adolescent athletes. And you can also demonstrate an effusion or lipohemarthrosis and an impaction injury to the lateral femoral condyle, which can also point you in the direction of an ACL injury. MRI scan, though, is the best single test for documenting the injury and for assessing the, any associated damage to meniscal and chondral surfaces, and can also highlight injuries to other ligaments in the knee. It's 95% sensitive and specific for ACL injuries. MRI is not so good though if you suspect a partial injury to the ACL. It's got a relatively low sensitivity or, and specificity for determining whether the tear is partial thickness. And in that setting, looking for other radiologic signs which might imply a full thickness tear, like a, a lateral bone bruising impaction injury, is a useful thing to do. Immediately following the injury, it's important to protect the knee from further injury. In some cases this might involve the use of a brace or crutches for a short time 
but simply asking the athlete to avoid sudden twisting or pivoting movements can also be sufficient. It's also important to encourage early movement of the knee and to start a basic strengthening program as both pain and swelling can create muscle inhibition and atrophy which can delay recovery. It's also important to initiate other simple treatments to try and control pain and swelling. You could consider using ice and a compression bandage as well as simple analgesia or anti-inflammatory medication. You should also try to encourage the patient to try and establish a normal gait. These are all important factors whatever treatment you're ultimately planning. In some cases, it may be appropriate to try and manage anterior cruciate ligament injuries without surgery. Partial tears of the ACL with a stable knee are generally successfully managed without an operation. Complete tears of the ACL can also be managed successfully without surgery. While a reconstruction is generally felt to offer an elite or professional athlete a more predictable outcome, some high-demand patients can manage without an ACL. These patients represent a select group who have a functionally stable knee and a very strong desire to return to sport. One possible option here is that a patient may elect for conservative treatment of an in-season ACL tear in an effort to get back playing football more quickly. Unfortunately, it's impossible to predict at the outcome who is going to have a stable knee and who will cope without an ACL. If these athletes do go on to have further instability episodes though, a delayed reconstruction can still be performed and has shown to be an effective treatment. Lower demand athletes or those who are not as concerned about returning to competitive sport can also consider non-surgical treatment. The key outcome for them is to have a knee that feels stable and that they are happy with. In this group it's less important whether this is achieved surgically or non-surgically. Finally, those who are not prepared to comply with the post-surgical rehabilitation program should definitely be treated conservatively. In the majority of athletes, an ACL reconstruction is generally considered to be the best available option. Repairing the damaged anterior cruciate ligament directly is not effective, and surgical reconstruction is the best available option. The majority of professional footballers are managed this way as surgery predictably restores a sense of stability within the knee. The reconstruction is generally done using either hamstring or bone patella bone tendon autografts. There's often considerable debate about which of these options is the best, but the reality is a strong argument can be made for either option. Patella tendon drafts are generally associated with more anterior knee pain and quadriceps weakness following surgery, but it's suggested that hamstring grafts may be more prone to failure. There are no, dif no reported differences in either patient outcomes or in return to sport though, so ultimately it comes down to patient and surgeon preference. During surgery, efforts are made to try and restore as close to normal anatomy, but the knee is never completely normal following the surgery, and it's important this is emphasised. In some cases, suitably prepared allograft can be used in place of autograft. While there are no definite indications for surgery, reconstruction is typically the best option when dealing with elite athletes, those with high demand jobs, in situations where multiple ligaments are involved, especially the postrolateral corner structures, or in situations when there is an associated meniscal tear. Surgery is also the best option when there's been a failed non-surgical treatment with recurring instability episodes. An interesting situation is how to manage the increasing number of adolescents who sustain an injury to their anterior cruciate ligament. These athletes typically have poor compliance and are very likely to return to sport football and to have recurring instability. There has been some concern about the possibility of damage to the open physis during surgery, but most uh, now accept the risk of this is low and manage these patients with a transphysial hamstring graft reconstruction. The idea being here to try and protect the knee from further damage due to recurring instability. Following surgical reconstruction, or indeed a period of immediate rehab, a coordinated re rehabilitation program is needed which incorporates range of motion exercises, a progressive strengthening program and proprioceptive exercises. Immediately following surgical reconstruction, the knee requires a period of protection to allow the graft to heal and integrate. The graft initially weak becomes weaker after surgery and does not re reach its full strength until about two years post-operatively. When an athlete typically returns to sport at around nine months post-reconstruction, the graft 
is only approaching 50% of the strength of a normal ACL. So for this reason, it's important to really have a gradual progression back to full training in their match play. While there are often time frames bandied about, it's important to realise that the return to sport is very variable and needs to be individualised. And it's important that the program is matched to how the knee is functioning rather to, specific, uh, to a specific timeline. While returning an athlete to sport, it's important to consider why uh, the initial injury may have occurred and address some of the risk factors which contributed to that injury. For example, some poor proximal stability or poor landing patterns. And where possible, it's also useful to use some objective tools and there are some well-validated measures for this. I think increasingly we're also realising the need to consider psych psychological factors and these are a key component now of return to sport programs. The majority of those who do have an ACL reconstruction typically report good knee function and are able to return to sport. But whether it happens is largely dependent on when the injury happens and who it happens to. So it's been reported that 90% of professional footballers are back playing at that same level within 12 months. If you consider the population as a whole though, uh, with a large meta-analysis which looked at 5,700 reconstructed knees, it doesn't look quite so positive. About 60% of those who had a reconstruction returned to their pre-injury level of activity, but only 44% of the total group returned to playing competitive sport. The level at which the, the athlete was competing at before their injury also dictates whether they're able to return to professional sport or high-level sport as well. For example, an academy athlete who sustains an injury to their ACL has a year of away from football is very unlikely to go on to have a professional career at that club. And in contrast, an established professional who's already under contract is far more likely to return to the same level of competition. Whether it's sensible to return to competitive following an ACL injury is unclear. We know that those who have injured their ACL are more likely to go on to develop osteoarthritis in that, in that knee than those who do not injure their ACL. And this seems to be independent of whether they're treated surgically or non-surgically. So the, the main role for an ACL reconstruction is to treat instability. We also know that a past history of an ACL reconstruction or ACL injury is the strongest risk factor for a new ACL injury, either in the injured or the uninjured leg. Those who, then, who sustain an injury to their ACL typically have shorter careers than their non-injured peers, and it's possible that a return to competitive football in itself may increase the risk of osteoarthritis. So the outcomes really are guarded, and we need to look at ways to try and prevent the initial injury occurring. Fortunately, ACL prevention is possible. Given the significance of an ACL injury, both in terms of the short and longer term morbidity, it's clearly preferable to prevent the initial injury from occurring. Large, well-designed studies have shown that ACL prevention programs are effective in both men's and women's football, and indeed a number of other sports. In general terms, this type of program has shown a better than 50% reduction in injury risk. The FIFA 11 Plus, which you'll read about, has been designed to be done in place of a standardised warm-up and to prevent the risk of all injury, including ACL injury. It takes less than 20 minutes to perform and need only be done twice a week to be effective. It's also designed to be coach-led and requires minimal training. Unfortunately, to be effective, these programs need to be done consistently. The influence of compliance and its importance has been highlighted well by the experience in Norway with ACL prevention programs and team handball. The programs that, which were initially initiated were very effective and, and resulted in a 50% reduction in injury. Unfortunately, when these programs stopped being promoted regularly, the injury risk increased back to baseline. The good news here, though, is that when the programs were reintroduced and consistently promoted, the injury levels have again fallen and this fall has been maintained. New Zealand football is committed to a nationwide rollout of the FIFA 11 Plus program. This means it's being integrated into all of our coaching courses, it's been done by our national teams and is integrated into a quality assurance, uh, a quality assurance program for clubs. In this way, that we hope that injury prevention will become part of the DNA in football in this country and that we'll see a long-term reduction in injury risk. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this talk. 
I hope that you found it useful and that you enjoy the remainder of the module.